Hi everyone, welcome to this video on the types of reactions lab. In this lab, we'll look at the general types of chemical reactions you'll encounter. The goals are to observe common signs of a chemical reaction, which could be either formation of a solid or a gaseous product, change in color or temperature of the mixture, or the appearance of light. Once you observe that a reaction takes place, you must write a balance equation for the reaction and then, in specific instances, either use the reactions to create a partial activity series, which we will discuss below, or write net ionic equation. So below is an example of what you'll have to complete in your lab report. Here a reaction between calcium oxide and carbon dioxide was carried out and you observe what the reactants look like which are just a clear solution and a colorless and odorless gas. Once the reactants are mixed you observe that the solution becomes cloudy a sign that a solid has been formed. The solid eventually settles to the bottom of the test tube. Since the reaction is an example of a combination reaction we know that the two reactants must combine to form one product. So we predict the formula of the product to be calcium carbonate as written here. Calcium carbonate is an insoluble salt so it matches with the observation that a solid product is formed. We balance the equation and we write the specific states for each of the species. So that's how you will complete each of the entry in your lab report. Now let's discuss the four common types of reactions that you'll see today. A combination reaction as we just saw in the previous example is a reaction where two or more reactants combine to form one product. A decomposition reaction reaction is the opposite, where one reactant breaks apart into two or more simple species. Decomposition usually requires some type of help to occur, for example, using a catalyst or heat. These helpers are not part of the reaction equation. They're just there to get the reaction to start or continue. So they're written on top of the arrow, separate from the actual reaction equation. Single displacement reactions are reactions with the following pattern. An element A reacts with an ionic compound BC, and the element replaces the catalyst ion B plus in the ionic compound. Double displacement reaction or exchange reactions are ones with two ionic compounds as reactants which then swap cations to produce new products. For a double displacement reaction to occur, one of these products must be a solid, liquid, or gas. Let's talk a little bit more about single displacement reaction and a concept called activity series. So the element A in a single displacement reaction can only replace or displace the cation B plus in this ionic compound if A is more active than element B. The word activity here refers to the relative ability of A versus B to oxidize, which means to increase its oxidation state. If A is more easily oxidized than B, then A is more active than B. To create an activity series, you can use your observations from several single displacement reactions. Here are some examples. If we mix iron metal with a copper nitrate solution, we observe the following. Notice the change in color in the iron nail indicating a reaction. The bubbles that you see stuck on the side of the test tube wall is not a product, but merely a sign that the reaction releases heat which warms the water in the solution. An actual gas product will produce continuous bubbling. Now this reaction can be written as shown here, with iron oxidized and copper 2 plus reduced to copper metal. This indicates that iron is more active than copper. Now if you take iron and then you put it in a solution of hydrochloric acid, you will see bubbles continuously appearing on the iron surface. This indicates a reaction which produces a gas product. So we can write the single displacement reaction shown here, with hydrogen gas being the gaseous product. Now notice that the element form of H plus is H2, not just H. Since there's a reaction, this means that iron must be more active than H2. Now if we take iron and put it in liquid water instead, this is what we observe, which is really nothing. So we would say that there's no reaction occurring between the two reactants. So that implies that H2 in this case is more active than iron. Given the last two results that I just mentioned, what should we say about the relative activities of iron versus H2? Because in one case we see that iron is more active, and in the other case we see that H2 is more active. This is what you should do. So H2 can be present as a liquid water water, gaseous water or steam, or acid. Each of these form of H2 has different reactivities versus metals, with the acid being the most react. So there will be metals that will react with acid but not with liquid water, as our example of iron shows. To determine the relative activities of H2 to a metal that has different reactivities, we compare the metal to the acidic form of H2. So if a metal reacts with acid, then it is considered to be more active than hydrogen. So 
So in the example we have then, we would say that iron is more active than H2 because iron reacts with acid. So a last result I want to discuss with you is when we mix rubidium with water. Here we see a very explosive reaction which produces hydrogen gas. There's so much hydrogen gas and heat produced that the heat causes the hydrogen to react with oxygen from the air surrounding the experiment, resulting in the explosion you observe. Because rubidium reacts with H2 in the liquid water form, it will automatically also react with H2 in the steam form and H2 in the acidic form, since those are more reactive forms of H2. As a result, we can immediately say that rubidium is more active than H2. One last conclusion is that rubidium must also be more active than iron, because rubidium can react with all the three forms of H2, whereas iron can only react with the acidic. Okay, let's try out the idea that we just learned in the following example. Here we are asked to determine the relative activities of metal A, metal B, and H2 based on the observations given here. First, we were told that A reacts with BC. So we can write that reaction here, and based on that, we would say that A is more active than B. Secondly, A also reacts with HCl, but it doesn't react with liquid water. Since we're comparing activity of A versus H2, and it reacts with the acid form, we would say that A is more active than H2. This is the same idea that we discussed above. Lastly, B, we were told, doesn't react with either acid or liquid water. In this case, that must mean that B is less active than H2, as given in these two reactions here. So that means that our conclusion about the activity would be A is more active than H2, which is more active than B. Let's wrap up this video by discussing the experimental step. It's fairly easy to carry out today's experiments. You're mixing one solution with another, so typically you will use a small or medium-sized test tube unless specifically told to use a large test tube or a beaker. For those reactions where the procedure asks you to use a large container, please do so, as these reactions tend to produce gases whose pressures will cause the solutions to be pushed out of a smaller container. Sample size should be fairly small for all these reactions. If you're dealing with aqueous reactants, use about one milliliter. You can estimate one milliliter of volume by doing the following. Take a dropper and add water drop by drop to your graduated cylinder until it reaches the one milliliter mark. The total number of drops that you add can be used as a way to measure one milliliter. Another way is you can transfer one milliliter in your graduated cylinder to a test tube, and then you can mentally mark the height of the liquid in the test tube that indicates one milliliter of volume. If you're asked to use a metal, please just use one piece. And if you're using solid powder reactants, use the tip of your scupula to get a small amount of sample. Lastly, for safety, you'll need to have all your standard PPE plus your gloves. Reactions involving heating or gas productions can be dangerous. They produce high pressure, which may result in unexpected outcomes. A small piece of metal can become a projectile or acid solutions can be pushed out of a small test tube. So make sure you have all your PPE at all times. All the waste must be discarded in the hazardous waste container that's shown right here.